Hi, today we're looking at the settings on a Sony A1 camera suitable for wildlife photography. Now, if I was to try to cover all of the settings on this camera, we'd be here for hours. So I've had to try and reduce it. I'm only talking about the settings for stills photography and I'm ignoring the video. And I'm only talking about settings for wildlife photography. I only photograph birds and mammals. I don't look at anything else. So when we come to settings that aren't appropriate, I'll just say we're skipping this, leave it at, at default settings. I was expecting the menus to be a bit of a mess. This is what I'd read about Sony cameras. They were difficult to get to grips with, although they had been getting better with each new model. Well, I've no complaints at all about the Sony A1 menus. I think they're very logical, very well laid out, easy to find things, and most of it easy to understand what they did. But it is overwhelming. There's a lot of them. If you've never used a Sony camera before, it takes a little bit of sorting out, so hopefully this video will be useful to other people who have never used a Sony camera before. We're going to start off by looking at my menus. Now this is a short set of menus that you can create yourself with all of the settings that you routinely use on a, on a regular basis. You can put them into this short set of menus and it's very simple to use. We come from the star light symbol in the top left hand side we come across at the moment I've got two pages of menu set up you can have up to six but we come down to my menu settings and then on the right hand side we can add an item sort an item delete an item or delete a page all sorts of things to create a tidy menu so let's just add an item we come to the right we add and then we've got all of the menu options here and we've just got to find the item that we want to add. So if I come back to image quality down to media, on the right hand side we've got format. Now all of us surely are, are formatting our cards on a regular basis. Every time I download my memory cards I then reformat them. So I don't want to go looking in the long menus to find format. If I can add it to my own set of short my menu then I know where it is. It's quicker to find. So we go across the format, we press the button, and now it's asking us which page we want to add it to. Well, I've already got it in menu one, but just for demonstration purposes, I'm going to add it to menu three. So this adds it to that location. There it is, it's added. If I come back to my menus, if we go up to three now, there it is. On the right hand side, we've got format. It's added it to it. So that's how you use my menu, very simple. Now we'll start looking at the, the proper settings. We come down to the camera light symbol. We've got image quality. Now this is the first camera that I've owned that you have to decide between JPEG and the newer HIFI format. So if you've always shot JPEG, just carry on shooting JPEG. But this is the new format and uh, you can choose between two different types. And I believe that the, the second one here is the highest quality of the HIFI files. But um, if you don't know what HIFI files are, you can Google it and it's, it potentially might replace JPEGs. I don't shoot JPEGs, so I'm not really concerned about that option. So we simply come down to image quality. I shoot raw files, so I selected raw here. If you do shoot JPEGs, then you'd be able to set the quality of your JPEG here and the image file size as well. But I'm only going to show you setting um, uh, raw files. So the first option is whether you want to shoot raw, raw and JPEG or JPEG. Well, I've selected raw. The second option is whether you want uncompressed or lossless or compressed. Well, I've chosen compressed. I've tested this several times, I've been sitting in the hide, nothing to do, and I've just taken a picture of a tree or something in the distance, and I've taken it all three of these settings, I cannot see any difference between them, and I wouldn't expect to either. If you're going to see a difference between uncompressed and compressed, it's going to be in extreme lighting conditions. So very contrasty conditions, or let's say you underexpose a picture by four stops or something like that, very extreme you might start to see a difference. But for all normal photography, I can't see a difference. And I said, I wouldn't expect to. So I'm quite happy with compressed and it makes it much easier to deal with the files. They're much smaller and uh, you don't fill your buffer up so much. But 
Okay, down to aspect ratio. 3x2 is the only ratio that uses the full chip. You've got some other options there, but you would have to have a very special reason to use anything other than 3x2. File format is a video setting, which we're not looking at. Same for movie settings. So we come down to APS-C. This is where you can crop the picture. You can have a much smaller file. You might need to if you've got a lens that doesn't cover the full chip and you can actually have it set to auto, which is what I've got at the moment. Because I only own one lens, which is the 200-600, with that lens fitted, the camera automatically recognises that lens as being suitable for a full chip camera. So the APS crop option is set to off automatically, but I could set it to off and, and leave it at off. Um, I don't normally want it on, and I'm not really interested in cropped pictures at all. Long exposure, noise reduction, I've got set to off. Anything like that I'm going to do in post-production on the computer, not in the camera. Same for high ISO noise reduction and HLG still image, all off. Colour space, I always keep to Adobe RGB rather than sRGB. Lens compensation, I've just left at auto for all three options. Down to media, the first one is where you format your card, we've just been looking at that. The second one is where you decide which files you're going to write to which media slot, or which memory card, you've got two slots. So recording media, notice the symbol next to it is, is a stills photography symbol. And the second line down, the symbol next to recording media is a movie film symbol. So the way I've got it set up at the moment, and there's lots of options on this, and it's very much a personal choice, but I'm, I'm writing my video to slot one, or memory card one, and I'm writing my stills pictures to slot two. All sorts of options, you could write both types of file to slot one and when it's full just start writing them to slot two. It really depends on the card you've got and the uh, capacity and speed of, of those cards. Auto switch media would be where it just it swaps from one to the other. When one's full it just swaps to the other. But all sorts of options in there. Recover database I've never had to touch and hopefully I never will. Display media information is really not relevant, it's just telling you um, how many images you've got on that, uh, on that particular card. Down to file, most of these I've left at the default settings, file folder settings. I keep it on series, I'm not sure whether that's default or not, but I want the number to keep incrementing, I don't want the number to reset, which is the other option. So I keep that on series, nothing else do I change there. If I had two Sony A1 bodies, I might change the file name. Set file name, at the moment all of my files begin with the letters DSC. With two camera bodies, I could change one. So at a glance, it's obvious which camera took which picture. That might be useful for fault finding, but normally you don't have to touch that. Not too many people are gonna own two Sony A1s. So I haven't, I haven't changed anything there. That's not changed. Just leave it a normal IPTC information. You could start to enter some at this point. I've no reason to do that. You can put your copyright information in, put your own name in there. Not that relevant to what we're doing. Could be useful to write the serial number too. I've put that on, um, never made use of it. Again, if you had two cameras, it would tell you which camera you were using at the, at the time if you develop a fault, but not vital. Shooting mode. Now this I find very useful. On the top of the camera, on the main dial, you've got the options 1, 2 and 3. And I make good use of those. I save my settings to each of those three options. And I really do recommend it. It's very useful. It's like taking a system checkpoint on a computer. You can always go back to it. So after you've finished setting your camera up the first time, if you save it to number 1, set memory number 1, if you get into a mess sometimes in the future, and with modern cameras you often do get into a mess and you find parts of the menu are greyed out and you don't know why, 
or just somehow something goes wrong well you can always just turn the dial to two and back to one and it will reload the settings that you saved as one and you can start again from there so i find it very useful so instead of recall settings you've got to set your memory settings first so you've got to come down to here now say this is after you've finished setting all the camera up so we go to the right and we're going to save the settings and we can save them to either one two or three now there is m1 to m4 as well that does the same thing but it does it to the memory card and that's just temporary because whenever you format that memory card you'll lose those settings but it could be useful for transferring your settings to that second a1 camera body when you can afford one but i just use one two and three so i'm not going to save the settings there because i've already got them saved but you you would just hit the center button at that point and it would save them and you can recall them from here but you wouldn't normally be doing that you'd normally just turn the top dial to the number that you you save them to and memory recall media is just telling it which slot or memory card to write um, M1, M2, M3, M4 to if you were to make use of that. So that's not very relevant to us either. Register custom shoot set. This is actually very useful. I have made use of this. If we go to the right here. We've got three options. Um, we can um, save a setting as custom hold one or two or three. And what this means is you have to allocate one of the buttons on the camera to pull up custom hold one and while you're holding that button in just on a temporary basis it will change the settings in your camera to whatever you put in here only while you hold that key down but that can be useful and I have made use of it so if we go across to one these are your options you can change all these setups so notice here I've chosen aperture priority, I've set the aperture and I've made it single shooting. So instead of the camera taking 30 odd pictures in a second, it's only going to take one picture. But this is when I press down a certain button, which I'll show you later, and it's only why I'm holding that button down. And you've got three options. I've only made use of the, the top option. Continuous shooting speed, I've left these at default, but for high, mid and low, you can change how many frames per second the camera is taking. Notice for high plus, there's no option. So on the top left hand dial of your camera, you can select low, medium, high, and you can change them in this menu. But the one that's high plus, you cannot change it. And when I first started going through these menus, that threw me a little bit. I'm sure I'm not the first person that it threw, but only those three you can change, and I haven't changed them. I have no reason to. Self-timer, not really relevant for the normal wildlife photography, nor bracket settings. You can change all sorts of options in there, but not really relevant to wildlife photography. Nor is interval shoot function, and nor pixel shift either. So we can skip all those and save a bit of time. Down to six, shutter silent mode. Come across to the right, we have silent mode settings. I've got that to on. I want a quiet camera to photograph wildlife. I don't want it bleeping at me. It automatically therefore puts it into electronic shutter. Target function settings. Uh, you can also make other things quiet on the camera. Well, nothing else is really causing me a problem but there's the options I've, I've got aperture drive standard and the next two down off but neither of those are an issue it's just the silent mode on the top one that I'm that I'm concerned about so as you can see it's grayed out shutter type because we're in silent mode it's in electronic shutter mode therefore so release without lens I've got that to enable I don't mind um, taking a picture if I haven't got a lens on I might be trying to solve a problem release without card disable I don't want to make the mistake of not having a card in the camera and start taking pictures anti flicker set there's two options there they're both to do with artificial lighting so not relevant to wildlife photography so we'll skip those come down to seven image stabilization I really just go for automatic on everything with this 
So steady shot adjustment auto. Zoom, it's actually quite an interesting one zoom. This might be something you want to play around with but I've actually got it set to optical zoom only and the reason it's greyed out at the moment is I'm shooting RAW. This will only work in JPEGs or HIFI files but if you are shooting JPEGs it might be worth experimenting with. You can go to clear image zoom and that's worth playing with. You can multiply the image by 1.5 and uh, there's supposed to be no loss in quality by doing so. But I'm obviously not using that because I'm shooting RAW. Shooting display, this is where you can choose what grid you want. I've got grid line off and um, if you had it on you can choose what sort of grid you want. I don't use it. Live view display set. Oh, this is quite an important one. You want the setting effect on. This is so that when you are under or overexposing your picture, you can actually see the effect in the viewfinder. You can see the picture going darker, and that's very, very useful. Exposure effect for flash, not relevant. I don't own a flash gun. Frame rate, low limit. I've got that to off. It's uh, when you get a very, very dark situations, it can, it can affect the viewfinder. Not really relevant for wildlife photography. Exposure and colour. So we come across to exposure. ISO, of course you can change the ISO with a button on the back of the camera, but you can come into the menu to do it. I've got it set to auto ISO, which I've had set ever since I bought the camera, but it's the first camera I've used on auto ISO. I'm not totally sold on the idea. I've always shot aperture priority before. But so far I'm sticking to the auto ISO. And you can limit the range of the ISO as well. The minimum and the maximum. If you need to. I wouldn't normally. Exposure compensation. Why you'd need to change that here, I don't know. You'd normally change it with the dial on the top of the camera. Uh, but you can change it there and you can reset it there. Exposure steps, that's quite an important one. I've always done over and under exposure in one third increments, but you can change it to half stop increments. But I prefer one third. An exposure standard adjustment, according to the manual, you should never have to use that. It's uh, unnecessary. It would be in dire situations. If there's something wrong with your camera, I get the impression. Metering. I've only used the one metering pattern since I started with this camera, the, the multiple. And I've always said I don't like to change the metering pattern on any of my cameras. If you start doing that, you, it becomes more and more difficult to know when you've got to over or under expose. Stick to one meter, metering pattern, get used to when it's not getting it quite right. So I've never used spot metering uh, on this camera. I have done with other cameras in the past, but not something I do very often. Automatic exposure lock with shutter, uh, extra option here which I've not had on previous cameras which is auto. So you can decide when you press the shutter button halfway down do you want it to lock the exposure at that point and if you do you'd have it on, if you don't you'd have it off. If you have it on auto it doesn't lock the exposure at that point, it locks the exposure at the point it focuses on the subject. So that's what I've got it to, I've left it on auto. Flash we're not going to talk about, A because I haven't got a flash gun for it and also I don't use flash for wildlife photography much anymore. I used to but no longer. Wide balance I've always just left for automatic. So it's just on auto white balance. Priority uh, setting auto white balance again not really relevant to wildlife photography so we're going to skip that. And I'm shooting RAW, so these are things I would normally change in post-production, not in the camera. That's very much the same for each of these options, they're really relevant to JPEGs. And if I was shooting JPEGs, I know that I would find it quite confusing to look at D-Range Optimizer. I've read about it and it looks like something you'd have to play around with a lot to try and understand it. But shooting RAW, it's not going to affect me, I'm going to do anything like that in post-production. If you do shoot JPEG, 
I would just leave it all at default settings and then over time start to play around with D-range optimizer. It's, it's doing everything very automated and you'd have to get used to it. Zebra display I've got off but uh, people do like this, it can be quite popular. Where the highlights are burnt out in your picture it will indicate this with some series of crossed lines like, like a zebra pattern and uh, you can customize it because I think it tends to exaggerate it a bit. It tends to tell you you've got burnt out highlights when you haven't. Down to focus, autofocus manual. Priority set in autofocus um, single shot. I've not used single shot at all since I bought the camera. I'm always in continuous focus and the bird tracking is so good I just don't think I'm ever going to use single shot autofocus again. But you can set in here the priority you want to give to it. Do you want to give it to priority to autofocus or release of the picture? So how, how quickly it will take a picture? Well, I've got it so priority is set to autofocus. Balanced emphasis seems to be quite popular with people, but I've left it at that. Continuous focus, likewise, I've put it onto autofocus. That means I won't be getting the 30 frames per second, and I'm quite happy to accept that. I've never counted to see how many frames per second I do get, but I get a lot. It's probably 25 plus, and that's more than good enough for me. So I'm more interested in it getting the picture in focus than taking more pictures. AF tracking sensitivity, this is how sticky the autofocus is. You're onto a bird, do you want it to stay on the bird or do you want it to jump onto another subject? That's going to be variable, but I've got it set up to one, so it's at its most sticky. Less likely to jump off the bird onto a, a, a post that the bird is flying past. AF illuminator, that's where the camera sends out a beam of light to help it autofocus. I've got that set to auto. I probably should have that set to off, but it's never been an issue for me up till now. It only does it when it's dark, and I'm not usually photographing in the dark, but I was doing badges recently, but I didn't notice a beam of light coming on. Aperture drive in autofocus is greyed out. Um, it's to do with silent settings again, so the fact I've got everything set for silent mode, I'm guessing overrides that at this point and you can't change it. Autofocus with shutter. Well, that means autofocus with the shutter button. So when you half depress the shutter button, does the autofocus start? Do you want it on or off? Well, we've got it on. Pre-autofocus, that means whether you are touching the shutter button or not, the camera is trying to autofocus all the time. That would be a disaster. So I have that off. Focus area wide. I did start off using the camera with the zone, which is a slightly restricted area of focusing points. Instead of occupying the entire screen, it's a slightly smaller area. But I found what was happening, I was accidentally touching the joystick and moving the zone to the left and the right and really messing up. So I now only use wide. And I, I find the bird tracking is so effective that it doesn't matter. I don't have to restrict the focusing points as I've always had to in any, any previous camera. And so I've left it on, on wide. Focus area limit. Here you can untick some of the options you never use. So if, let's say there are three options you use when it comes to the range of focusing points. You could just leave three of them ticked so you wouldn't have so many to select from. I only actually use one so I never go into the selection, so I've actually left them all ticked because I don't use them. I don't go into that part of the menu. Switch vertical horizontal autofocus areas on every other camera I've owned. I would be worried about that and I, I would definitely set it up so that it worked. As you turn the camera into vertical mode, it will select different autofocus points to when it's in the horizontal mode. But again, with bird tracking, just not having to worry about it at all. So I've left it like that. I could actually switch it off. There's an option for off, but it really just doesn't matter. The focus area color, we've got a choice. I've left it at red. Area registration, set up your own focusing points. I don't need to do that. I'm not interested in setting up any. 
and that's where you deregister them or clear them but I don't do any of this so basically we're just looking at things that I don't use don't feel the need to use and I've just left them at default settings face eye autofocus well this is definitely important to me I've got it switched to on on the top line and down here I've got it switched to bird when I've been photographing hares or deer or badgers I usually forget to switch it to animal mode and I've not noticed any problems even on bird mode it still focuses on the eye of the badger or the deer but there must be a reason for it so if I'm thinking about it I do swap to animal mode when I'm photographing a mammal here you can untick some of those options so if you never photograph a human being you could untick it so you don't accidentally select it seems a bit over the top that one to me I don't get the option to select right or left eye and I don't use any of those other options not really relevant to wildlife photography so we'll come down to four auto magnifier in manual focus I have off I don't like it as you turn the dial it zooms in in the viewfinder it gives you a bigger image to allow you to get the manual focus correct I find it fiddly and, and awkward so all those settings below are irrelevant because they're all to do with the magnifier so we come down to peaking display and this is what I do have on if I'm manually focusing I want peaking display on I've got the level set to high that is something you could change from time to time but I certainly do change the color from time to time sometimes white is appropriate but if you're photographing a gannet and trying to do it manually white might not be very appropriate so you can change the color of the peaking peaking is when the pixels that are sharp as you bring them into focus change color and you can see which part of your picture is in focus and it's only for manual focusing and I do find that quite useful and if you're shooting video you certainly use peaking more often than you do for stills photography but there are occasions I've done it with stills photography as well so now we've come to playback now this is fairly standard I don't think there's anything I've changed here and it's the same as just about any other camera so I'm just going to say we'll leave all that at default because I can't cover everything in this film it's going to be too long same for networking we're not going to look at networking either so now we come down to the last one setup and the first one is very simple that's where you put your language in whether you want Italian or English on your menus and the area you're living in and the date and time very standard very normal reset save settings first of all you can do a factory reset here and set the camera back to the point it was when you took it out of the box and uh, with this camera I haven't had to do that but I certainly did with my Olympus Micro Four Third system in the early days when I first bought it I got into such a mess I had to go back to factory reset you can also save and load your settings so you're, if you're happy with the settings you've got in your camera you could save them write them to a memory card and put that memory card in another Sony A1 and, and load them not something that's going to affect too many of us this is a very important one operation customize so we go across to the right now notice we can customize key settings three times there the top one has got the symbol for stills photography then for movie and then for playback so you can have custom key setups for those three different options so let's just look at stills photography the top one all works exactly the same for the other options too and if we come down the left hand column you're looking at the camera from different angles that's a, a close-up of the buttons on the right back of the camera and that's showing you the buttons from the top of the camera and there's one final one as we come down the left hand column which is the button on the side of the lens you can change that as well but if one of those buttons you want to use for something else you can do and you've got the the numbers of the buttons indicated on the diagram on the right hand side so for instance button number two which is the one that's marked as AEL on the back of your camera in the top right hand corner we can change that I don't actually need to use the automatic exposure lock 
so I can set it to something else. Now if you remember earlier on we set custom hold one. So what I've done is I've changed that button to pull up custom hold one. So if I now select that what we can do here we've got a long list. All these are options that I could set that button to do. And you could set it to do nothing. You could set it like that. But what we're going to do we're going to go back to where we started. Oh, no, not there. Here we are. So what I've done is I've selected that one. So if you remember when we set it up custom hold one it lowered the ISO and it turned it into taking one picture at a time instead of uh, 30 pictures at a time. So if I press that now I've, I've done it. That's, that's actually the options. That's what we saved it as. So as I hold down the AEL button, it overrides whatever settings I've got in the camera and just allows me to take a picture single shot, one at a time. But I've got to hold the button down while I do that. It's just a temporary hold. And you can change all of the other buttons too. I don't actually change many of these. I find it confuses me if I do. But it's useful for one or two things. FN menu settings, I don't change any of these. I just feel there's already too many options there for me to change things. Um, I've got my menus, I use that a lot, and I use the top dial, option one, two and three on that top dial, and I have set up one or two of the buttons to do something different. I don't need lots and lots of options for changing things on the camera, and I will just get confused if I do. So I don't really use the FN menu settings very much. I'm sure most people probably do, but you can change things around in there if you want. You can add things, but I don't. Display screen mode set. You can do both the monitor on the back of the camera and the electronic finder. So let's just look at the finder and you can say which of those options you want to show up in your viewfinder. Very much a personal choice, doesn't really matter too much, not that important. Record with shutter button. So if you're in video mode, do you want to press the red button on the back of the camera to start the video running or do you want to use the normal shutter button? Well I want to use the normal shutter button when I'm in video mode. So I've got that on. Dial customize. I haven't touched much of this either, but in the same way you can change all the buttons, you can change what the dials on your camera do. Uh, I found this a bit confusing when I started reading about it, but you can set up the front dial, the rear dial and the main control dial on the back of the camera to do different things. I think you'd have to have a very special reason for doing this. I say there's already lots of options for you to customise. I don't really feel any need to customise the dials. Now this one you could change. This is fairly simple. AV TV assign in manual exposure. This is just two options. You can decide whether the front dial changes the aperture or whether the front dial changes the shutter speed. And, uh, and vice versa. So at the moment it's set up so the front dial sets the aperture, the rear dial sets the shutter speed. This is in manual exposure and the top line does exactly the opposite. Personal choice, you might want to match it up so it is the same as a camera that you've previously used and what you're used to. You can also change which way you want it to rotate and I've just left it at, at normal. Again, very, very much a personal choice. Dial exposure compensation I've got set to off. That's the rear dial if you want to use it for exposure compensation in some circumstances. I don't. I've got the compensation dial on top of the camera. I'm just quite happy with that. Don't want too many options. That's greyed out. Lock operation parts. I've got that set to off. You can set it up so that you cannot accidentally change things. You can't perhaps change the uh, the multi-selector or the rear dial or just everything. But I don't want that. I, I do want to be able to change things so I've left that off. 
touch operation I don't actually use the touch screen very much if I do use it it's usually when I'm doing playback but even then not too often but here you can say whether you want it on and how sensitive you want it touch panel pad I've left that as both valid I really can't quite see the point in that but if uh, it's called a, a panel or it's called a pad depending on whether you're looking through the electronic viewfinder I found that a bit confusing but anyway I, I don't really use it so it's not much of a problem find a monitor you can set it up so that you're using one or the other you're looking at the through the viewfinder or you're looking at the monitor at the back of the camera I've left it on auto so that as my eye moves to the viewfinder it swaps to the viewfinder and as I move my eye away from it it swaps to the monitor monitor brightness I've just left on manual and viewfinder brightness on auto temperature default default for the magnification display quality I've got this set to high you can also choose standard the only disadvantage of having it on high is it uses up more battery the manual doesn't indicate as to by what percentage that is just says it uses up more battery so if you've only got one battery for your camera you might want to think about putting it onto standard is there a difference in quality it's one of these things where you you swap backwards and forwards and you're staring hard at the image trying to make up your mind can I see an improvement in quality when I'm in high mode eventually I convince myself that I could but it's very marginal it doesn't make a lot of difference the finder rate display I've left it standard and this again is a little bit confusing what it says in the manual is if you're photographing a fast moving subject if you have it on a higher frame rate and you've got various choices here high and high plus you'll get a, a smoother image it'll help you to follow the subject at the same time if I set it to high what happens is the display quality is greyed out and I assume that that meant the display quality had gone back to standard doesn't tell you in the manual but I went backwards and forwards and staring at it and I say it's a marginal difference anyway on display quality but I decided that yes when I went into a higher frame rate the display quality went down to standard so I think that's what's happened there so I leave that one at standard so that I've got the display quality at high and can I see a difference in the higher frame rate to help me follow a moving subject no I can't so not too worried about that one but everything there I've left at default apart from the bottom one so I don't feel any of those are particularly relevant to wildlife photography we come down to auto review you can have that off or you can have the last picture that you take remains in the viewfinder and on the monitor for two seconds five seconds or ten seconds I find that very distracting when it does that I want it off so when I finish taking a picture when I release the shutter button as soon as it can the camera goes back to live view so I, I'm actually looking at the subject again ready to press the button again so I always have auto review off and I have done on all my other digital cameras auto monitor I have switched off so you can have different timeouts two seconds to ten second timeouts I don't want that to happen it's too short but the power save I would normally have set to one minute but there are occasions when I have it off because I'm waiting for a subject to come in that I know is only going to be there very very briefly and I've got to be ready I can't afford to have the camera go into sleep mode it's off at the moment because I'm doing this film and uh, I don't want it to time out on me so power save start time normally one minute and that helps a lot to save the battery but it does mean you have to touch the shutter button to activate the camera again and get it to come out of sleep mode which is can be a couple of seconds before it happens water power off temperature I've left at standard there is another choice of high it's not a problem I'm having with the uh, temperature of the camera causing an issue sound off option is really to do with video so we can skip that USB we can skip nothing to do with wildlife photography same for external output I associate that with video more than stills photography 
Uh, down to setup, which is the last page, we're almost there. The only one that's relevant to me here is the anti-dust function. When I did my review on the Sony A1 and the 200 to 600 mm lens, a number of people pointed out to me that I could be making use of this. I was complaining about getting dust on the sensor. With my Olympus Micro Four Thirds, I never get dust problems at all. It's it's very good for dust. My Canon gear previous to that was terrible for getting dust on the sensor and I'm getting dust on the sensor with the Sony A1 and uh, people pointed out that when I power the camera off to change the lens or put the 1.4 two times extender on if I have this on the shutter will close over the sensor which is going to help me keep the dust off it and I'd forgotten about this and the reason I'd forgot about it is I shoot on electronic shutter and as you can see, shutter when powered off is greyed out. So when I first came across this, I thought, oh, can't make use of this function because I shoot with electronic shutter. So I really just ignored it. The top one is sensor cleaning. You can clean the sensor electronically at, at any point. So I have solved this problem. Um, I've set up the C3 button on the back of my camera so that whenever I press it, it comes out of silent mode. It comes out of electronic shutter, basically, into mechanical shutter. And if I do that, I'll come out of this menu. So I have to remember that if I'm going to take the camera body off the lens, I should first of all press the C3 button, which brings me out of silent mode, puts me into mechanical shutter mode, and then I can power the camera off and the shutter will close over the sensor. That's it. It's over 40 minutes long, unfortunately, but thanks for watching.